what is going on everybody hope you are having a wonderful week so far uh before we start if you are listening to this i'd love it if you subscribed give us a little review um and i think you can do to share it just means the podcast reaches a bigger audience and means that more people listen which means i can get better guests for you all so thank you very much to everybody that does listen um podcast time good boys good boys don't really need much introduction their first big record that came out was with medusa as peace for your heart which is currently as i record this is at n- just on spotify alone in 968 million streams then the follow-up was lose control which is nearly at 900 million streams and they're at 12 million monthly listeners on on spotify so realistically i don't need to give them an introduction however i spent um some quite a bit of time with them on ship on edc ship um and really enjoyed hanging out with them they're absolutely lovely guys extremely talented guys as well and i really wanted to like get them on talk about their story and kind of talk about the ups and downs of having hit records and building a career in what we call the music industry so i will stop rambling on and let the podcast start without further ado good boys josh and ethan aka good boys what is cooking lads how are you very good thank you uh it's 10 in the morning which is earlier than we normally start but other than that we're very good how are you yeah thanks for uh thanks for coming on so early it's uh it's a day of podcast recording for me today so um oh wow yes yeah, it's, it's good to uh you good bashing to get out a few on. today yeah i've got four today if everyone turns up oh wow. my goodness yeah it's um do you find do you ever do like multiple sessions in one day when you're writing songs sometimes yeah yeah I, Yesterday was a mega day. I did three yesterday. Oh, how do you do that, man? Back to back to back. Well, uh, it, I was lucky to be working with some awesome people. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it is a little bit training and you have to have a list of ideas to fall back on because nobody's that inspired. <laughs> yeah, I've never, I've never done, a, like everyone's always like, how do you do like three, four, five podcasts in a day? And I'm like, oh, well, it's pretty easy because the like conversation, if you're reasonably okay at conversation and the other person, the, the people you're talking to are reasonably good at conversation, you can keep going. Yeah. But like when it comes to writing sessions, I've been in sessions where like I'm leaving and the person that I'm in with is like, oh, I've got to go do another session. Now. I'm like, that is just sounds draining. Yeah. It's yeah. hectic, isn't it? I'm right there with you, Will. I'm, I'm, I'm spent after, you know, one session, two songs, maybe three, and then yeah, I think it's the changing of location that I find exhausting, and then the meeting really? of new people. Do you know what I mean? Like you go from one session to the other, and then there's lots of like, obviously you don't want to just jump straight into a song. You still have to like do the niceties and things, and then I think the social side of it can be, you know, a little bit uh, taxing as well on a day like yeah, that. I agree. Because how how do you guys go into a session? I know we're jumping into things and there's a lot of <laughs> intros to kind of talk about this, but we're jumping massively into this. But going into sessions, for me, like the whole point for me about writing with somebody is like the social side of it. It's like mm. the bond between me and the writer, me and the singer, me and the producer, like whoever I'm in with. For me, it's like, can I make, is this person going to be somebody that's in my life for a long period of time? And like, can I build a relationship up with them so that even if we don't make the best music, we have a fucking cool friendship and there's like something cool at the end of all of this. It's not just business. Do you guys go in with that same, like, how do you guys work with that? Yeah, I mean, I think when you are getting started, there's a bit of speed dating that goes on where like, if you, you know, if you haven't come into the industry as part of a band or like a group of friends that are all musicians, there's going to be that period of speed dating where you do loads of sessions with loads of different people. Um, but I think now we've sort of rounded the wagons a bit and we've got a small group of people that we like to work with. Josh, and... is, Josh is the only one person that I know, by the way, who uses the most ye old man sayings in the world. And I still don't even know what they mean, but he uses them in enough context that I could kind of guess. But he's like, we're going to round the wagons. And I'm like, I'm in. 
What does that mean? Yeah, no Random. outsiders. No outsiders anymore. <laughs> just like the crew. Um, so I think for for our stuff, that's kind of the way we approach it. Is like there's a group of people we know and like working with, and then if we write for other people, sort of then it goes a bit broader. And yeah, I'm glad that you said that, Will, because I think that's the way that we've been thinking. Like Josh said, we've really that's quite a that's relatively recent for us as well. Like, and sometimes you feel a bit bad, but making the circle smaller, but wording it the way you just worded it, like putting more value on the actual friendship than the results of the song is a great way to I've never thought about it like that I've never thought about it like you know do I want to go for a beer afterwards with this person or do I just want to run away like that stuff's really important Josh can I do you can I ask a favor can I get you to turn your headphones down a little bit because those headphones are classic for leaking and I can hear Ah. Ethan twice hang on a second how's that yeah, I think... Hello, hello, test, test, one, one. Ethan is annoying. Way better. That's way better. Uh, Thank you, mate. You're welcome. Can you still hear us, though, Josh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was worried about something in my ears before. No, nah, I, I think that's the thing. Like, it's... For me, it's, like, such a personal experience is writing music with people. And I don't mean that in, like, a hippy-dippy way. I know we. I can sound proper wanky by saying that. But it's, like, genuinely, I'm going to... If I'm writing, let's say for instance, like I don't know your relationship with with the Medusa Boys, right? But I'm just using you for an example, and you can tell me if it's completely wrong or not. But like, you guys have written the record with Medusa. You have some of the biggest records that's happened in the last century, right? In dance music, especially. Mm-hmm. Like, if that was with somebody that you didn't like, that would suck. Like yeah, I've, yeah. I've had it, I've had it where I've got a very successful record that I is not not got my name on that I've written, but like one of the writers is an absolute dickhead, mm. and I don't want anything to do with that person. I don't really want to talk about that record because yeah. there's 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 a relationship that just doesn't feel right. It doesn't fit sit well with me. Yeah, and I think there's something Definitely. about it's it's like it, it, it's like choosing your partner. Like whether your your boyfriend or your girlfriend, it's like, is this, it it feels very similar to me. I don't know about you guys. I think because when you're also like creatives, you're, we're like, we're emotional beings. So that, that, that when you think, when you like think of a record, you, there's so many emotions attached to that record and it can be tainted by stuff, especially when the business end kicks in and everyone's managers are involved and you know even when a record's done and sounding good you never know which way it's gonna go on the politics side of things and people can really su- surprise you and that is such a shame because yeah i know me and josh have songs that we, we that ever that people love uh not the medusa ones by the way but there's songs <laughs> that people love that have come out and because something really small or something um that is slightly frustrating happened in the process that's kind of it's not based on the music anymore. It's just based on your emotions towards that song. And you, you know, you might not put it in the set for that reason. And then you're like, why do I not put this song in the set? It's just because, yeah. you know, how you feel about it. But it's, just, it's the same. And I think it, there's like a, also a huge process of, of, of working on ourselves for that. And it's like, it's like looking into like an ex partner and going, actually like, although it ended badly, we had a fucking wicked time at the, during it, right? And it's yeah. like, how do you how do you process that? Because especially when the, the difference between a partner and the music industry is you've got business and money's involved, and people get salty around money. I guess it's the same in a partner. Like sometimes, mm. especially with like divorce and stuff. Like that, I don't know. I've never been divorced, but like it, it's it's very similar, and it's yeah. it's a it's a no one teaches you that no and like i think kind of our experience of the and i think a lot of people's experience of the music industry is in the beginning you're just doing it because you absolutely love it and you're like muddling through with your mates um you know like some of the people that we still work with today are like there's a writer called connor blake was just one of our mates uh and we were making music together like before any of this and then, you know, into this pure like thing which exists of mates creating art for the love of creating art. Suddenly, money 
is like dumped right in the middle of it. It's like, oh, hang on a minute. We need to like make sure that we can stay mates and try and keep this purity of the, the pursuit of, you know, the creative pursuit, like you say, without sounding wanky, um, whilst also trying to put a roof over our heads. And it's quite a delicate balance to like carry out. How, how do you balance that as two guys that write together and also two guys that go into a room and write with other people. That's something that we had to carve out pretty early on because <clears throat> off the back of PC Heart, there was just lots of sessions and me and Josh, like what Josh was saying, really, we were just writing in a be- in, in my bedroom, producing and in, 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 uh, trying to make really bad dance songs. Uh, and then uh, uh, PC Heart happens and obviously the session quality is elevated and you put in a lot of really big rooms and then the demand for both of you is big because good boys can be in two different rooms and people yeah. are just as stoked about that and i think the way just on like a practical level we'll call certain sessions good boys sessions it's just a really practical way of doing it for the other writers as well be like before you know if someone reaches out and they want to do it and we're like okay is it a good boy session or we're writing for someone else and then at least you've had the conversation prior to the session and then if someone pitches it or whatever then it's all good yeah. um, but it works really well because you know if you if I was to put my business good boys hat on uh, you know let's say Josh is in a session and it's not for good boys but it ends up being wicked and sounding like a good boys record which is, there's a good chance that it would if Josh is in the room then there's a option for a collaboration or it gets pitched and it has you know we've done some production on it and then that becomes a conversation of um do we then bring it into our our own little blender and work on it as good boys and you know that's kind of how it works but each song has pretty much been different so far um but it just means that we can spread ourselves spread the net a little bit wider and, and 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 it opens up way more opportunities for collaborations because if you're less precious about it the song can go a bit further you know when did you learn to not be precious about songs? I don't and know how if did I, you learn. I don't think I have. <laughs> I, I haven't. I'm I like, respect that. Yeah, I, I massively am the one that's like, no, I know this is a good idea. And I'm the nightmare guy that will do like a thousand versions with like 10 different people's input. Um, because... I don't know, somebody said to me like early days that like sometimes if if it's the right idea, it's better than like making 10 new things. You just got to get the idea right um, to I think some of our mates like absolutely hate that about us. Um, but I, I do think that there is some there's obviously some source in learning when to let go of something and not be precious. But I do think there is some source in like holding on and grafting an idea and I I think it's a little bit lost in the modern music world of like I'm going to do a session Mm. every day and I'm going to end at five and I'm just going to let a label or a publisher pitch this song I think there's Mm. some there is some like source in just revisiting 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 and grafting it and like I mean a little bit about us like we came from like the gospel space growing up um, writing gospel music And like, that was the process. You would like work on a song for like six months maybe. And like, you'd do it on a Sunday and you go, oh, that bit didn't feel right. So you tweak it again. Um, So it's it's been part of our, being like precious has been part of our process, I guess. (laughs) No, I, I really actually really like that concept because you're right. I think the way from my experience like modern dance music is written now is it is a factory and Mm. i'm not really in the pop world i've written a few pop things but like i'm not really in the pop world and it feels similar in that world but i can only speak for the dance dance side but it it feels like just constant release right release right release right release and just Mm. hope that there's some virality on a record Mm. that like comes out eventually i think Mm. like just for example i know this is coming out later on but like the single we're recording this in february um but the single that i've just released 
that got ri- written in 2022 and it's taken this long to like get to the point where first of all a record label even wants it first of all we but before that first of all we got to a point where we actually are like yeah we should probably release this second of all find a record label or multiple record labels that then fight about it and then one one chooses which one gets it mm-hmm. and then then you have to a and r it again because somebody wants to put their two cents in of course and then it comes out and you're two two years down the line and the records come out and but it 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 takes time and i think but there's also a huge romance about a 30 second idea turns into an absolutely massive hit and yeah it doesn't and it doesn't necessarily need the work i i think that maybe like combining the two things we've talked about is like a little bit of our process so like with the medusa stuff Obviously, everyone goes like, oh, yeah, this is like amazing moment in Peace Your Heart. That's like, whatever. But the truth is, we'd made like a whole bunch of other songs with them before that that were awful. Um, yeah. You know, like really bad. And, uh, <laughs> and totally different vibe as well. They were like sort of like Kygo vibes, I would mm. say. And I think that there's something about working with the same people and doing a whole load of stuff together. So like, uh, like, like say with the Medusa boys, after we've made Peace of Your Heart, which was this like crazy 30 second idea, then you have to follow it up. And you know, we're, we're freaking out going like, well, I don't know, <laughs> Im- imposter syndrome, I don't know if we can. And actually we did like, I, w- I would honestly say about 40 sessions together after wow. that to make the follow up single. Um, and then, you know, for, that's kind of been our, like where we've found success um, is just in writing loads of songs with the same people. So like we've, like, we've done a whole load of stuff with James Hype as well. And, mm. um, you know, back in the day before James Hype was what he, you know, the, the Machine. monolith that he is now. Yeah. yeah. Um, we were in James's studio like every night, some weeks, like three nights a week until two or three in the morning because James would start sessions at 11 at night uh, and we were working Animal. yeah and we were working <laughs> full time at 11 o'clock at night I know so and, and we both had full-time <laughs> jobs at this point as well so yeah. we were like doing it and then like going to work in the morning but you know like we made um with James and a couple of other mates uh this this tune Ferrari and uh you know we like I say, we'd done like probably 20 other songs before that and we made it in 2019 and then it just suddenly comes out in 2021 or 2022 and it becomes what it is. But we've, you know, done like, I don't even know how many versions of that song between when mm. it, we originally had the idea and when it came out, just going, oh, I know it's a good idea, but it's not quite right. Oh, let's try it like this, let's try it like that, let's try it with this person singing, let's try it, you know. Um, so yeah, I guess working a lot with the same people i think you come up with a maybe a different thing than if you are just speed dating and because you f- you feel more able to suggest up like crazy ideas i think it's having that confidence in the room with somebody as well and like knowing that you're not going to offend somebody yeah definitely it's like anything though like if you were to take it off music and go you know for for like someone who's doesn't know about songwriting or has never been in a session you go oh how productive is the meeting going to be if you've never met them before or yeah. you're or, or there's like a ceo in the room and you're really nervous to suggest something and you've never met that ceo and you're all brand new and so everyone's kind of treading on eggshells around each other or is it your absolute boys just like people from your desk and you're just used to shouting at each other and things can move really quickly because no one's getting offended if the idea is rubbish or, do you know what I mean? You can yell at each other. You can be like, good idea, man. We're not putting that in. Do you know what I mean? Like, and no <laughs> one's offended because you're just like, these guys like me. I know they like me and I'm not. Whereas if I said that to some, you know, I don't know, some brand new top liner I'd never met before, I'd be like, you know, if you could just sing in key, that would be great. She'd be like, or he'd be like, well, you can't say that to me. And you can, you really can. Um, but we can to our friends. So, you know, that's why it's, yeah. it's productive. It's it's funny that 
because it's like how there's that i feel like there's always a time in a session where the ice breaks and yeah. you like you you take that risk of saying something that you know you, you're not too sure if it's, it's either going to go two ways <laughs> it's either going to be like they're going to fucking yeah. hate you and they're yeah. just going to like suck it up and be like oh i have to leave at five o'clock yeah. or they're going to yeah. be like you're a dickhead but you're so right yeah 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 100 percent. yeah and uh, and those are the those are the, like the the big deep breath moments where you can be like oh great we got there this yeah. is this is gonna be easy like this is yeah yeah uh, so i go on josh carry on no we were doing a session last week uh with a guy uh and two girls and we we knew one of them didn't know the other one and uh about like you say like two hours into the session the guy made a dick joke and we all just sort of stopped and looked at each other and were like, is this okay? And then everyone laughed and like, okay, cool. And it kind of, it, yeah, it like relaxed everybody into it. But for a second, it was like, oh, hang on. I want to show also... the guy wasn't me. I didn't. Really no, it wasn't me. Ethan. It wasn't Ethan. <laughs> it's always really interesting, especially like, it's, re- it's actually really scary and I, I don't like it because I feel like Every, not everyone but most of us are all coming from the kindest part, side of our hearts if you know what I mean when yeah. we're having a laugh in the studio or just having a laugh in life we're all generally nice people um, but again you can offend people and people can 100%. be offended and also this industry is so small mm-hmm. that like you offend one person without even knowing you're going to offend them that word can get around so fucking quickly oh, yeah. and and it's really scary and i've i've found myself in studios where um, i'm just like i how do i crack this how do i like get over that first initial relationship because i don't want to offend somebody but also like i just don't know so i have to almost like be blunt and just ask and just go up be up front with them and Mm. because i think it's like it's the realistically it is business and it's the case of writing a great record yeah and can we if we can break that barrier to start with then let's crack on and i don't think loads of people talk about like um to your point i don't think loads of people it's not really something that you would like learn at music school like how to be sociable but you know it's so it's so integral to a session but like yeah you wouldn't spend loads of time like learning about it you just that's just you have to like ha- learn social cues in like a tiny box room that you're putting and told to write a song it's like it, some of the best producers we've ever worked with are just amazing at making you feel great yeah. and that feels like such a large chunk of why the song ends up being good and like what we were saying about being emo- like feeling a certain way towards a record if you make it like there's producing like on the tools on the desk and then there's like producing the room and like some of the big boys in you know like in LA and America they're just um, like you meet them in person and they're just amazing they just make you feel amazing and, yeah. and it's like there's almost a science to producing an artist like if you're in a room with an artist and you're gassing them up they're gonna write awesome the stuff best you know what I mean and you're talking to them about if you spend an hour talking to them about their life before they have to sing an emotional song into do you know what I mean there's like there's producing people which is a, a, a whole other thing um which you're 100 yeah you're 100 percent right i remember listening to the rick rubin i think it was a rick rubin and james blake podcast and it was just after rick had produced his not his last album but the album before the like super emotional album mm-hmm. and i think it was like james was like yeah i came to the ranch and was like played you all this music and you were like it's good but you can do better Mad. like yeah. you can do like way better and then they then just spent a month of pretty much just doing therapy between yeah, themselves yeah. and just like opening up to each other and like and I don't know how much Rick does in the studio like <laughs> I don't think he necessarily does that much mm. like in a sense of actually on the tools or actually songwriting or actually just like engine whatever but that then the the process of how he spent the time with him 
let his wife come over like did all of this and just kind of made him feel at home and comfortable to be able to open up to like unlock another level of artistry mm. yeah. which then made it allowed him to then write another album that was just amazing yeah yeah amazing it's the, the process is special and the it's role of the really producers cool. sort of like changed over time as well because now if you're a producer in a room because of you know everybody's got access to logic and able to turn off fruity loops or whatever it is you might use you know the producer is the engineer now but like I don't know if you've watched the Beatles, you know, that extended documentary. I loved watching mm. the producers who are involved in that because they're just, they're, there's an engineer in the room who's sort of doing what we would now describe as the producer role. You know, yeah. they're the one recording, editing, comping the takes and stuff. But the producer is the person in the room going, oh, try it like this. Oh, can you, what if you put this fill there? They're actually sort of the glue. and. I don't know, I, think, I feel like that's something that we've sort of lost a little bit. Um, I'm trying to bring it back. That's, that's my goal, is to try and bring it back, because I'm fucking not that talented in the studio, <laughs> but I can talk a good game. <laughs> so it's, yeah, but, but the bridging the gap is difficult, because you still need to know how to use the doors, and the, yeah. you need to know how to put the, the phrases. I think it's hard when you've got an engineer who, or uh, you know, like a junior producer or something, is in the session. He doesn't know what you're asking them to do. It's like, yeah, uh, you still need to be able to articulate it. Um, but yeah, I think there's like a there is like an in between gap, which sometimes the vibe falls through that gap of, um, oh, we've got like a really talented, um, I don't know, producer, but he's not said a word. And, do yeah. you know what I mean? Because he's nervous, or do you know what I mean? Whatever. It's like, and then the vibe kind of. Uh, <laughs> how how do you, how do you guys with with the relationship between both of you how does it work in a sense of that because i've recently worked on a project myself that's been a year long project and i've although i've been writing sessions for myself with lots of other people but then i've been coming back into my studio working with somebody else on those specific records and just the relationship between me and his name's Mitch Jones, like me and him, like his made, it's, it's completely changed how I've looked at producing and also like the, the concept of writing a, a record and also the ability, like it just adds so much more diversity to the session. Um, mm. But I don't think I would have been able to get that if it was just like a one-off session. Mm. Mm. I think that part of it is like having to agree that an idea is good, I think changes the dynamic. So like, uh, well, everybody thinks their own ideas are good, obviously. Uh, so I think that having somebody else, like whoever it is, if you trust that each other have like the best intentions for the song or the project as sort of like a, a given, then, you know, it's actually great working with other people and working with somebody else like Ethan with a shared goal because otherwise I think both of us would go on a completely different tangent or you lose sort of sight of what it is you're trying to make or uh, I'm probably a bit more emotional in what I want to do with songs whereas Ethan's like very focused on keeping it uh, with universal appeal so I think that it works nicely because we sort of balance each other out and even even not just music in a project like if I'm angry at somebody who we're you know working with or doing a deal with or you know management or whatever chances are Ethan isn't and vice versa so you can sort of find your center somehow yeah and I think like the amount like the amount of times that I've been fuming and Josh is like nah it's not that bad and then likewise Josh will be really angry at something and I'll be like nah I went through that the other day it's not that bad like I do you know what I mean like and then you know you, you're kind of like whereas if you were left to your own devices you just probably spiral a little bit and you do like Josh said there's a centering of like uh like and I think even on the collaborative sense it's like I, I try my best to have like a a, a of being a reasonable filter like am I being unreasonable so like before I like interject or before my like emotions just go 
no I think I think I'm right I ha- try and run everything through like a filter of am I actually just fighting for my idea or is it, yeah. is, it is that idea better and I think once you remove your emotions from the the kind of almost like competitiveness um, of, of fighting or like wanting your idea to be there you can you can you become a lot more like subjective you just become like ah uh, is it like the end goal is the benefit of the song great is this is this better for the song or am I just trying to get my idea and then you know you sit with it for a day or so and you go ah oh, actually I think it's better do you know what I mean and yeah. whereas yeah. if you just e-jerk react to stuff which I've, I'm very guilty of I do all the time but I'm trying trying to get better at that, that stuff it's a process right it takes time but I think yeah. having having each other allows the process to kind of run a little bit smoother and also you guys know each other better than anybody else that's going to be in the room with you so you guys can be completely honest with each other Mm. at the same time which i think is very helpful when writing records especially nowadays when it is about getting shit out as quickly as possible yeah yeah it's a bit like a marriage me and ethan because you know we're traveling constantly like often we've maybe more in the past but we've shared rooms and you spend like all of your time with this other person so mm. yeah <laughs> kind of start to read each other's so, mind like, yeah you can that's what I was exactly what I was about to say like you can I know that someone's going to say something in a session and I know that you know me and Josh will kind of like cowboy eye each other as if to be like is this are you going to take this one or shall I because it might be you know if it's for, in a session for a good boys thing it might be something that we wouldn't write about and yeah. you know we're both like like Josh said like kind of reading each other's minds to be like um, ah we probably wouldn't do that do you know what I mean but like we're, we're both on on the same thing and you only get that with like yeah like literally like five years of touring and sharing bedrooms and just sat, and sat next to each other on a plane and, and, and sharing music and like I remember like we were probably about three years in to Good Boys and had done a bunch of stuff like you know, piece of hearts out, loose controls out, all these other records are out. We're touring, and uh, we both realized that we loved like old kind of early rave records, like mm. early boys noise kind of like fake blood. You know, like all that type type of Blog, stuff. Bloghouse days. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we but we never spoke about it, and it was literally like we didn't know. And Josh was like, "Oh yeah, I've got all these CDs that I like." And so we, you know, referencing all these sounds and stuff. But it's like we we spent like three years not even knowing that the other person, like, even listened to it or knew about it. Do you know what I mean? So it's like quite yeah. fun, um, all that stuff. That's so dope. I, I, it's it's just nice being able to get to know. It sounds really, really airy fairy, but just like being able to build a relationship with somebody where you can just like they're just your mates, and there's nothing better than doing shit with your mates. Yeah, it's just it just makes it fun. Yeah, I mean, even if you own. hate each other, yeah. even if you hate each other, it's like on days, like you wake up and you hate each other and you piss each other off, but you just yeah, know yeah, that they're always going to be a mate. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what it's about. We and, kind of had that... this. We've we've fallen into that kind of relationship with uh, I don't know. I, I think you know biscuits. Yeah, uh, he's like another. For people that don't know, he's another DJ from the UK. Uh, he's an insane producer, but we. Uh, we met him once in the studio we were put in the studio together and it was just the funniest five hours of my life and like we're all just sort of slightly awkward slightly introverted like creative dudes and it just I don't know we were all on the same wavelength and now we have sort of love spending time with each other so much we've done like I don't even know how many songs we've done like a full US tour together. We've done, we're about to do European versions of the same sort of back to back tour. But like mm. you say, it's just because we just like hanging out and that's literally what, where the tour came from and where the stuff came from is because we were like, yeah, we just really like each other and the vibes so are important. high. <laughs> it's yeah. so important. I think, I think it can be lost so easily in, in business, right? It like, managers get involved agents get involved and they like pay you with like oh go do this go do that like this is gonna sell well if you do that like i I know i've had the conversation with my manager my manager's like oh can you can you go on tour with this person and i'm just like 
he was like it would sell really well and i'm like yeah i know but i just i'm just get a weird feeling from them so no <laughs> yeah like no, it's, it's just but but like if i could take one of my best mates or that's like maybe like not as successful if you know what i mean wouldn't where we wouldn't sell as many tickets or but it would be so much fun mm. yeah but maybe not make as much money like that yeah. sounds way more appealing to me I, to, if i'm honest and i think the people that who come to the events and who see stuff online they like they they can tell when there's a good vibe and when it's a genuine friendship and i think that's something yeah. that people appreciate and sort of can connect with rather than so you know some of these collaborations i'm not going to name anyone but sometimes you see these collaborations it feels like sterile a, a label has yeah. gone one plus one equals mega hit and yeah. it's like, i don't think these people you've met before they've like no nope. yeah the sausage factory machine has just pushed it through yeah i've i've i'm sure you you know people but i've had a call from somebody from one of my mates i can't name names but he's like dude this was done in his session and he wasn't even in the room and it's now my single and now he's put his name on the record <laughs> and like yes it made it a mega hit mm. but like it's just not authentic however mm. we're in the music business and the record labels need to make money yeah it's true. And, and once you have like you get so much peace from when you like what you just said like you get so much peace whenever you like think about it like that because yeah. if you actually just articulate it in your mind, like to an extent, they're a business and they need to make money, then you're totally. like, you, you know, you get so frustrated at certain things because it's not like creative or it's not like you know, you're like, you know, you're questioning certain things as to whether that's like it, you know, it doesn't feel right, and then you're like, ah, it's, it's there is a business side to things, like I yeah, you know, fair, do you know what I mean? And then you just yeah, you, it kind of chills you out a little bit, <laughs> at least with me anyway. Oh, I got crazy. Yeah. So talking talking about business, you guys have had extreme success, like from what most people would even dream of. How much pressure does that put on you guys every time you release a record? Because I'm not stupid in thinking that that's an easy process to kind of go through, especially especially from your first, the first big record that everybody knew was Piece of Your Heart, right? Like and mm. i'll be i'll be honest like i wasn't aware of you guys before that mm. um i know you were doing stuff before that but i i wasn't aware of you so like how does that does that still is the pressure still there and how was that pressure initially i mean initially it was a nightmare to be honest it was like, <laughs> it, <Yeah>. it was <laughs> it's like um i know it sounds like sh champagne problems and it definitely was champagne problems but the first song had become that piece of heart had become such a, a sort of success that there was so much pressure to follow it up um and we like i kind of said before about imposter syndrome you just feel like it was a fluke i don't think i can ever do it again yeah. um and then you know they suddenly put us in with all these like ethan was saying sort of a-list writers and then you feel like, oh, none of my ideas are going to be as good as these people's ideas. Um, and then I think I would still say to a degree now, you know, we, we're five or six years into this and we've had like a reasonable number of songs we've been involved in, like do quite well. I have like some degree of confidence that, like, oh, sometimes I do have good ideas. But even so, when we go into a session and somebody brings up like, uh, you know, some of the songs you've done that are successful, it puts a massive pressure on your shoulders because it's yeah. like, cool, so is that what you're expecting from today? This, you know, yeah. mega hit song or I don't know. And I think yeah. it puts this weird dynamic in the session where sometimes, for mm. me anyway, my process is I like to try a hundred ideas and then decide which one is the best. And yeah. sometimes if you go into a session and you've, done something that's done well recently, you might suggest the, something and then people in the room go, yep, that's it. And you're like, oh, hang on a minute. I don't even know if that's it. I'm just, that's just the first thing that's come out of my mm. mouth. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been weird and definitely very high pressure. And I think as well, like it's, 
I don't, I don't know if poison chalice is the right phrase. Josh, you'd probably know that's a ye old phrase. Is that what I'm <laughs> yeah. trying to say? Poison chalice. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, but, but to, 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 to like give context. <laughs> I've started thinking. It's so it, good. To, to give context is like, so yeah, you do those records and it's fine. And then, and then you, like you say, you've got to build your own project. And then that becomes like, oh, well, you're involved in those records. Somehow your project will be just as big and you spend yeah. most of your time trying to convince people that's probably not the case. Like, yeah. and you put so much pressure on chasing hits and, and trying to be algorithmic. And then you go too algorithmic and that sucks a lot of the joy out of it or like the source out of the song because it sounds algorithmic and it sounds like you're trying to repeat tricks. And I think then you go down the wormhole of, well, the reason that song was amazing and worked is because it was different. So then you're, you've had a taste of being a part of a record that changes something. Mm. So you don't change, chase the same record. You chase the feeling of being part of something that changes something, if that makes yeah. sense. And then that becomes a really weird headspace to be in because no one wants to do sessions with you because you sound like a mental person because you're like, let's do, like, you know, you're chasing the new thing so it sounds nothing like what they want to write. Your head is like, I'm currently going in the direction of, like, mentalness because that's what yeah. we had success from last time. And then you kind of, you know, I think you, we, all, like, all these years on, we've found a nice middle ground which is like, there is the, there are certain rules and there are certain sonics and there are certain things that we like to stick to and there are certain things we know people like and then there is margin for like doing mental stuff um, yeah. and I think that's where we want to live but it isn't like we're out here whipping ourselves every time a song doesn't get like a billion streams because you'll just go insane so throughout <laughs> throughout like lockdown and me and Josh just like having just long like chats and good conversations with each other it's like it's about creating bodies of work it's about nurturing a fan base it's about solidifying like your touring and your place in the market and so much of existing as a DJ in today's like modern DJ world is just about surviving like to an extent yeah. if you can survive for like 15 years through just the chaos then yeah. you'll probably be doing really well by like that 10 year mark do you know what I mean like you'll mm. probably be quite up there but it's just so hard yeah. to survive and it's so hard to keep your finger on the pulse and so that's kind of like where we're at where we set our in the middle of setting really long term goals instead of right next year we need a hit it's like no in 10 years I'd love to do this and yeah. how do we put things in place so that we can get there and that takes a lot of pressure off the session. It takes a lot of pressure off like our relationship. It takes a lot of pressure off um, like just your, your own personal life where you're like beating yourself down trying to get this next thing. And you're just like, oh, actually, the goal is long term. And the goal is to be paid to knob around with my mates and do music. Yeah. That's, that's like actually the dream. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like that knobbing is the dream. around in a hotel room with biscuits in Denver and yeah. you're all on salary to do it. It's great. It's like, that's the goal. So I want to, I want to dig deeper into that because I, I genuinely love that. And I think nobody is talking about that nowadays. Like nobody is talking about the long game. And because I think we're in that world of virality and needing to have a hit straight away. Like, and for anybody who's listening, I'm sorry. I, hooted and hollered about this for so long but f like <clears throat> I've never had a hit record I've had big records I've never had a big a, a hit record and don't get me wrong every day I wake up and go fuck me I wish I had a hit record <laughs> right now. but like I think realistically the the I'm I'm 10 years now full time as a DJ and I still haven't had a hit record and for me there comes a point in my career where especially now where i'd like i think a hit record would actually really help me mm. in a sense of i'm not the new kid on the block mm -hmm. um i have been around and done lots of things and i've had an extremely successful career 
I'm, I'm very fortunate and extremely happy with what I've done. However, I've nowhere near reached my goal of where I want to be. Mm-hmm. But again, sitting back and reflecting, I've got another 10 years of this. I've got another 20 years of this. I've got another 30 years of this. Yep. Like we're, st- we're all still young, yep. young guys, mm-hmm. right? And, and I look at the people that have been around for that long and there's not many because a lot of people just stop, mm-hmm. right? Because, because I feel like life changes, um, people aren't willing to put the work in as what they, they did. Um, everything changes. But I, I guess I kind of want to go more in, in detail with you of like, what is, like, how do you work that 10 year goal and how do you kind of break, bring that back? Because we can all have a pipe dream goal, right? We can all have that, that goal, what you said, I just want to fuck around with mates in a hotel room and get paid for it, mm-hmm. right? Technically, you're doing that now, mm. but which is fucking cool. But how do you go, okay, in 10 years time, I still want to be doing this. What do I need to do to get there? Yeah. And, and mm. do you guys set goals for that? Do you, do you work that out? How do you kind of get to that point? Well, to, to your point, well, like I, I just separate from this, um, we've spoken about this before. I know we mentioned it uh, on, the, on the cruise yeah. ship. We spoke about this. <laughs> Uh, we don't talk about the cruise, um, but uh, <laughs> but I remember you, you you said the same thing, and I remember thinking something at the time which I never uh, really mentioned. But t- to your point about you having uh, success now, ten years in, like if you were to have a yeah. quote unquote mega hit, you have so much infrastructure in place that yeah. there is almost like fertile ground for the hit to land and yeah. be fruitful do you know what i mean like you would mm-hmm. you'd be able to jump on tour you'd be able to handle more shows you'd be able to do this you'd be able to do that and it would be whereas uh, i think when we had when we were part of uh, the first song there was zero infrastructure in place and sometimes i'm really glad that it was medusa leading the charge on the single because we had such yeah. little infrastructure in place that like having to go to like the grammys and having to get on a get a booker and what's your logo we don't have a logo great make accountants, one. Do you know what I mean? like all yeah the, like accountants lawyers like all of the boring stuff sheer chaos didn't don't have publishers don't have a label like just chaos and then trying to tour and like there was not it wasn't a very uh yeah it wasn't very fertile ground for for it to land and, I, and i'm and i'm really um happy that it wasn't just like a good boy song it was like you know, we were able to um, plan a little bit because the you know a lot of it was like Medusa leading the charge. Um, so I think now we go into a place like what you said, where it's like we're building and uh, there is infrastructure in place, uh, luckily. And uh, and yeah, we kind of have to. I don't know if we probably should set goals. I don't know if we do, Josh. To be honest, but we we yeah. we, we have long term. No, plans. no, you could you can be honest. We. Every year at the start of the year, we have a whiteboard and we mm. sit with the whiteboard and oh, we, do we plan what we want to do for the year. I've still got the whiteboard at, of this year's one like up in the house and yeah. um, like kind of where we want to be musically throughout the year, by the end of the year, um, what kind of artists we want to be aligned with show wise, release wise, those kind of things. Um, Cause you, you know, with the music industry, you've got to work like six months out, essentially. So, because yeah. you've got to make the records, get the collaborations signed off, get in the studio, six weeks lead time, eight weeks lead time, you know, it's like sort of six months out. Um, so I, there is sort of some intentionality to it, I think. I, I, yeah, definitely. And, and uh, we have a, a little side list of people whose uh, music we like and Will's on the board, but he knows that. he knows he's but you know what I, and it's I like reckon... being intentional about collaborations um but I think which that's i did a... force <laughs> we're on we're on record will asked us for the session so i asked you lot yeah no <laughs> we we would have asked I, just, I think we were just too nervous to ask yeah <laughs> never be too nervous yeah but i think that no i i think go on no, i go think on, being Josh. part of the culture is like part of it as well so like obviously will mm. you're such a part of the scene around your music and your label is that there is longevity because 
you you know even like, I know we were joking about like blogosphere dance days before but that is we were all like part of that and we've been music yeah. lovers since then and so we're so deep in the scene now me and Ethan sometimes joke we're like oh yeah that song's rinsed that song's done and it's actually not even out it's just everybody that we yeah. know has been playing it it's not done yeah. it's not rinsed but yeah. I think that because you're like because you're in the scene and you're in the clubs you're at the festivals like you know what is coming next and I think that's how you have sort of longevity because uh, uh, you develop this sort of like foresight that the guys who are, and I'm not slating them because you know, some of these people are my best friends, but the guys who are just in sessions day in, day out, like in the studio that listen to music once it's released, but they're never in the clubs. You know, they're not yeah. listening to like demos that are sent to labels. They're not, get, they're not artists, so they're not getting sent demos from people. They don't know what is like the swell and what's the next thing. And I think yeah. that is where like the magic and the, the huge sort of breakthrough moments come from is like tapping into what is going to be the next thing and it just hitting at the right time as that thing comes mm -hmm. in. Yeah, I think it's also. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think it's also for me is about like with you, you guys must have had it with the medusa records it's like everyone just tries to copy yeah mm. and and for me copying just really isn't something that you can create a a career around like you guys have a sound and that's good boys right mm. no one else can be good boys no one else can make a record they can make a record that sounds similar but it's never going to be a good boys record yeah mm. so the thing that i really struggle with is the difference between taking inspiration and copying <laughs> and i think we're, we're talking about the like it's very fine it's a very fine tune in but mm. in the commercial world and I, i'm not too sure how you guys must come across it a lot mm. more than well no it's, it happens in my in like the underground scene as well massively yeah but it's like there's somebody sees success in a record and goes i need to do that because that's what's successful mm. however that isn't success yeah yeah and, and i was think only from... successful because it was a new thing and now it's exactly. like the minute you replicate it, it's not a new thing anymore yeah Sorry, Josh. and the joy of creating and writing and like the point, I know this sounds so like, you know, whimsical, but the point of making music is like coming up with new ideas. Yeah. yeah. And like, I guess there's, that's sort of the business versus the art side, isn't it? It's like, if you're in it for a business, then yeah, there's, there's a business to be had in just hopping on every trend and recreating you know, recreating, that's probably the, 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 the distinction, recreating rather than creating something new. Yeah. And I, I guess it's, it depends on your approach. But for me, anyway, the joy is in trying to come up with a new idea. Yeah. And yeah. I think if the, if the approach is, I'm referencing it because I think it's sick and it excites me and I heard it before everyone else heard it, I was gassed and like, I genuinely am a huge fan of the song. So I want to reference this thing from it because I liked mm. it as opposed to that's been successful and so I'm going to copy it because it's an algorithm. Yeah. And I think the way to know that you're not doing that is you're referencing songs that have 5,000 streams on it as well and going, that yeah. really excites me. I'm going to reference that thing from that song because yeah. not, there's no success to it. It's not a successful record at all. And that's something that we try and do lots of. It's not that that's not successful, obviously. That is success because they're probably touring loads. <laughs> um, by releasing those records. Uh, but um, but the, the thing that we try and do, especially if we're in a, a mainstream session, I don't know if that's the right word, but if we're trying to write something that might cross over, we are bringing to the session songs that we play live that they probably haven't heard of some of these you know mm. like um pop writers we're trying to play really niche things that don't have any success and yeah. we're trying to play them and we're trying to reference um sounds that really excite us sonically and that we know work live and then pair them with you know some 
maybe some mainstream things and some and, and, and like hooky songwriting tactics and all that sort of stuff it's great but I think there's a really exciting synergy when you put the two together and it also helps you from going insane by going I'm going to use the exact same bass noise as the thing that's in the charts and you're like yeah. well why why because it's, it's done now it's out there it's in the world mm. um, it, it, the, 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 yeah I there was there's been a couple times in the past few years where I've heard that once that was when you guys did the Medusa records and then secondly recently with Calvin yeah. and Ellie Golden yeah. and you're just like it's all I hear now yeah. and also in the underground scene is like hard techno yeah mm. I get sent so many demos for the record label just just fucking really hard techno and I'm like go listen to what I'm releasing yeah, yeah. like I've go listen to what I play I don't play this I've never played this in my life yeah. so like please don't send it to me but that I think that's the, the, where we kind of cross the business and the passion yeah yeah. because I think what kids are doing not just kids that's really condescending of me but people that just they they think that they have to copy to have success yeah yeah it's the actual really weird things that come through that doesn't sound like anything else yeah that actually are the success and there's a lot of scaremongering from like not scaremongering but like there's a lot of pressure from labels to be like yeah. that needs to oh that's good we should make something that sounds like that and if you're actually in the session you're there going i really want like you know how many times have you been told to reference fred again in the last two years it's like <laughs> i just can't if i hear fred again i just turn my brain off because because there's no point He's so good at what he does, and yeah. and and he's really good at being himself. So he's probably the best yeah. at being Fred again because he is Fred again. Yeah. Uh, do you know what I mean? And you're, we're the best at being good boys because if someone sends me a good boy song, which they do all the time, like on DM or send to Dropbox or whatever. It's a fully finished song with someone who sounds like Josh singing a song, and it's fine. They go, "Hey man, I've, I've made this for you," and I go, "Sick man, well you've made a good boy song." Uh, you like sounds like a good boy yeah. song but we didn't write it we didn't make it so why it's and it's finished so and it's not as good yeah well maybe sometimes <laughs> great but yeah maybe it's not as no, good no but it's it's the it's the fact because it's like then it's not as good because it's not come from exactly, you exactly yeah and if, and if we wanted to make that song we could sit down and make that song because we are us <laughs> do you know what I mean yeah and, and you should yeah, go and yeah. find out you know kid who sent the link who you are because yeah. you've made a song that sounds like us, and that's great if it's a pitch song. But if you're trying to do the artist thing, you need to go and find out what you want to tell people. I guess. So talking about that process of finding who you are, how did you guys find who you were? Was it the case of having the hit record that then was like, oh, actually, this we've been doing this for a while, and now it seems to work? Or is it just a case of working together? Like, no, how did it took you guys ages. Find no. It's taken ages. <laughs> took, and I think we're only getting there now, to be honest. Like, we... Yeah, yeah obviously, we had those big moments. Uh, and then we also had some other big moments that, like, we just don't talk about anymore now because we're like, oh, I wish we hadn't done that. Um, just... You know, like basically doing everything that we've just preached about not doing, we did about like you know like jumping on a trend or like. But no, but that's, but it's because we've learned through like making our own mistake, basically. It's the only way. Yeah. But I guess the issue, the, not the issue. There's no issue in any of this. But the thing is, is the mistakes that you guys have felt are mistakes mm. have been so successful mm. that it's just so out there. Yeah, I, I mean, think I'll, if you I'll, were to look I'll, through I'll, our discography, you would see that we're absolute silly gooses and we just do stupid <laughs> shit every now and then. Like, it's pretty cohesive. And then it's just one thing. It just makes no sense. And then if you, you know, come into the studio with us for like a day, they'd go, oh, no, that makes sense. Like, you're nailing yeah. it, you're nailing it, you're nailing it. Stupid idea, shouldn't have done it. Nailing it, nailing it, nailing it. That's kind of the rhythm. Yeah, and we kind of, you know, like, we're the guys that will do something for a joke and then it sort of gets out of hand. But... Yeah. Well, I, I, I genuinely think like, you know, the thing about second album syndrome. So like, yeah. if, if a band has been like playing together for five or six years, they've been touring these songs, they get the songs sounding, feeling great. They work in a live setting, then they record them, they make the first album. You know, it's amazing. It wins all these awards. And then a year later, they release the second album and it's crap. 
And it's like, well, yeah, because they've not done like six years of touring and refining and working on their sound. I think that we, when we started, we hadn't done the six years basically. Mm. Yeah. And I think now we've done, well, yeah, six years of touring and doing shows and what, what do we like and what kind of sound do we like to play? And I think what our live sets now are a very, like, we've got a, a sound. And obviously sometimes you have to be more commercial than you might like to. Sometimes you can go a bit more underground, but you know, I think we've found a sound and we, we've been doing these like linked sort of online, I don't know, sets. And I think that is the sound that we want to play. And mm. that's the sound we want to do. And it's the first time where we've looked at something and gone like, oh, we found our sound and like we're happy with it, we're proud of it. It's locked. Yeah. And it took a while as well, is the other thing. Like I think people people that like t like like take the example of someone having um chart success because their song's gone viral. The yeah. amount of times that me and Josh get brought in either from a label or from whoever, from management or publishing, whatever, to help write um some kind of follow-up just as everyone else is kind of getting drafted in to help it's like all hands on deck yeah this person doesn't didn't know they were gonna have a hit let's help them try and write another one um the 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 the, the amount of times that because of there's this like virality to songs now the amount of times there isn't infrastructure in place or a project in place or even like sounds like horrible but i say it from a place of like being in a similar place there is no there's no there's no real artist there and they haven't figured out who they are so you're trying to fight write a follow-up for them and as you're talking to them you're like so that you know what i mean they, they can't tell you who they are and they can't tell you what they want to be and that's a really um mm. and that's and i only say that quite um freely because i've been in that place and me and josh have been there so it's kind of like okay well you need to go away and figure out what you want to be and you're on by the way you've just had a hit so you're on like the clock now and that's, that's a, a tough place to be and I think we've had to watch people come into the charts or have huge success and not follow it up and in order to see that like that's not a sustainable thing to do like what you were saying like 10 years in have a hit 100% don't follow up doesn't matter I've got a fan base I've got all this stuff in yeah. place whereas if you're having a hit and you've not got this narrative you want to tell people like i was saying to my friend the other day like they're everyone and their mum's a dj now like it just is how it is yeah. and that's great there's probably more djs than there are artist projects mm -hmm. at, by quite a considerable amount i would argue and i think yeah. if you want to start releasing records you need to also because it's 2024 it's more than just music now people want like fans want meat on the bone they want to be able to buy into a project and if you're not yeah. ready to tell people something when you release a record then you're almost setting yourself up you're risking failure because you, people want to know about it and they want to release, mm. listen to more records and they want to go back and listen to your discography it's like there's yeah. sometimes not anything there to listen to and that's what and I'm only saying that because that's what we've had to go and do and go right what what are we trying to tell like who we know who we are now, but like we've had to go away and figure it out um, yeah. and be authentic. That's the that's the fun bit, though. I think when you sit back and look at it, and and I know like during it, and I, I I've not been in the situation where you guys are at, but like I can imagine the pressure during that situation of like trying to figure it out can be really demoralizing. I've been in situations where like, okay, fire my management, leave the record label that I'm known for go try and go into a different world that's just like so not what i'm known for but then and you realize how shit it is that process yet when you reach those little targets and those little goals how happy it makes you feel and how you realize that you're actually on the right track and then when you get to the point where you're like yeah i'm there but then the artist kicks in and you're like okay what's next yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah 100 percent it's a, it's a, it's a is, long journey. It's a killer. <laughs> I want to. I want to talk about record labels because Ethan. I know when we were on ship, 
and Josh was, I don't know what Josh was doing, but sleeping. We were no, you, you don't want to know. Oh, honestly, you really don't <laughs> want to know. You definitely weren't sleeping. You definitely weren't <laughs> sleeping. No to sleep. We were watching you on stage. <laughs> um, but we spoke about, like, quite candidly, like, the power kind of struggle between or the dynamic between artists and record label and artists and A&R. Ooh. And I think go in from where you guys were at, where what happens generally a lot of times is, and tell me if you feel I'm ro- if I'm r- wrong in saying this, but an artist has a bit of success and then a record label comes on board and is like, you need to do this, this and this, right? Mm. But you guys had huge like success that nobody could ever think of as it, quite early on in your career how does that change the dynamic between you and the label mm. That's yeah a good question. well i think that in an ideal situation kind of what we're saying like back in the day labels used to like build artists and they would like yeah. create an artist project with them and they would invest in them over a long period and now the dynamic has shifted because of things like TikTok where labels try, or major labels, maybe I should say, try and sign things that are already moving that are like a yeah. guaranteed win. Um, and, you know, it's it like Ethan's point before, it's a business. So, like, you know, you have to understand that these people's bonuses are based on them signing certain things. And I don't have any problem with that. That's That's like any job. But then... You know, we, like many artists, I think we've found ourselves stuck in a position sometimes where, you know, the the label are paying X amount for a song. So they, they're like, we need this to be a hit. Mm-hmm. So then, but you're like, well, nobody knows what's going to be a hit. And to a certain degree, if you invest enough into the marketing of it, it will be a hit. You mm, know, yeah. that, so there's like a bit of chicken and egg and it's really difficult um, balance to strike between wanting to create something, do something new, push the boat, which ultimately is where the hit will be found. But then the labels are obviously looking for security in what mm. is an investment into you. Um, yeah. So we, you know, we know people and we've looked at doing similar things with ourselves, like restructuring deals so that you can release more music and yeah um instead of just like having this one flagpole moment it's like um mm. you know all of our chances are on this one song which yeah. even just mathematically isn't a good idea yeah. um you know it's, you, you'd spread that right yeah um i think that that's just been an interesting dynamic for us to work out and we've arrived at the conclusion that it's we don't want to chase this one big single and then as soon as you've released it and it does well you're back into the rat race of oh my goodness we need stress 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 we need to write another hit single you know that mm, yeah it's it's, it's horrible but versus we want to make the music that we love to make and people seem to enjoy and then build it up that way mm. Mm. like the the success rate for people who have been dropped in right at the deep end and have signed a massive deal and there's loads of pressure versus someone who has climbed through indie labels and or starting a movement or is part of a culture that's growing. Um, I read something the other day which was sick. Someone posted it and it was something along the lines of there is a movement growing right now that I know nothing about that is really cool and I hate, I'll i probably hate it if I hear it and they're probably having the most amount of fun and I'm going to hear it. That was DVS1. Yeah, yeah, what was that? I, just, I probably one. absolutely butchered yeah. it. But it's it's so true. No, you're right and it was, it was like they're probably wearing something that I think is fucking gross yeah. <laughs> but it's, they're loving yeah, it. Yeah, and I think yeah, that the right. success rate of doing that versus being hyped about to death and then dropped in this huge deal which does work because obviously it's a business, if they're invested, they're gonna need to make their investment back. So they're gonna keep putting yeah. their resources into you. And all that's great, but I would err on the side of caution and like what we were saying about building the project is you can arrive at that 
at the like top of the stairs, so to speak. You can yeah. sign to a club label, release some club music. You can withhold maybe some of your more like popular ideas because you don't have access to a major label yet. And then you can start to release like, and you can build your own like silo of culture. And then as you kind of get traction and these a and are like, they're not silly. Like they're on SoundCloud, they're on every, like they've heard your music. Definitely. They've heard everyone's music because they're, that's what their job is. Um, and it's funny when people are like, I just can't get my music to these majors. I'm like, no, they've heard it. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> they've heard it. So it's not good. <laughs> um, so unless it's, unless it's, unless it's nowadays, it's no, they haven't heard it cause you're not on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. don't have 10 jillion followers on TikTok. <laughs> um, yeah, they've heard it. It is good. You don't have a social media budget. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> but you can, but you could arrive at the, at the, uh, and I, and I, and I wish, you know, uh, don't have any regrets, but, um, that would be something that I would love to have done, um, where you build to the big, cause then, uh, cause then an, yeah. an A&R knows exactly what they're signing. They know exactly what the culture is. They can see the project and then they know what it looks like yeah. going forward, as opposed to together, we're going to have to build and somewhat fabricate this project together and that does Ooh. work but it's harder for it because then there's more work for the A&R and, blah, blah, and, the, and the label and they're helping you discover who you are whereas if you turn up yeah. and you've got like a relatively small fan base and movement then they're going to sign it because they're going to be like I get it I know exactly what it sounds like I know exactly what the first song is going to sound like and the chances are they're not going to bet loads of money on the first one doing well they're going to go yeah. I'll sign it for whatever and then it'll, and those are the records that do well like I think um, mm. some label like yes yeah, the, the, there are some major labels that I really like for like being a part of the culture and signing stuff where there's a groundswell and then it does well and you're like yeah that's how it should be really like um, that makes me feel like there's yeah oh, I, I, I think I think I totally agree. I think there's some major indies that do really well as well. Mm. Like let's say, for instance, your Ninja Tunes. Like, I know XL is a major kind of because they sign Adele. Mm. Um, but like, XL is like a great concept as well for me. Is like you don't really hear much about them, but they release really great stuff and they work it. Yeah, they work it so well that like one record out of an album might not do well two records out of an album might not do well but an album will do well yeah and i think like i had a conversation with dot from the london grammar on the podcast um and i don't actually i don't think he actually said it on the podcast but i spoke to him and he's like as london grammar as the band they've never had a quintessential hit record mm. but they've had a hit that every album's done like number one yeah yeah exactly and and every record on the album because they've built their fan base everything that they've done does well because their fan base is so important to yeah. them and i think that that's the value in the long in the long term however there does come a point when your fan base gets old yeah. <laughs> and it sounds it sounds really like disrespectful but you, like let's say for instance you're john summits now mm. his fan base is so young mm. however in 10 years time john summit's fan base is going to be 10 years older they're all probably going to be having kids yeah. and and settling down and not going to rave so it's like how do you keep that fan base young mm. um which is a re another complete another conversation on branding yeah. and reinventing yourself and and keeping relevant um it's a tough one that as well yeah definitely like yeah, i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that that's where a lot of the um, like what you're saying about labels a lot of the there is a shift that's probably happening in dance music which is like um, people are um, people are protecting their livelihoods almost to an extent yeah. I, I think they're going great okay well I need to nurture this fan base and I need my you know I, I want to be able to drop a pin somewhere in the world and sell tickets um, so yeah. what does that look like without a global hit? Um, because the yeah. chances are, even if you have a global hit, they're going to know the song and not you. Um, yeah. So do you want to sell hard tickets in Sydney? 
and do you want to sell hard tickets in Germany? Do you know what I mean? And then what yeah. does that look like? And um, you know that you can have three massive hits in a row, and still people might not know who you are if you don't have this huge infrastructure of pictures of your face and yeah. radio interviews and billboards and just blasting people with like who you are. Like you could low key be like huge successful and you know not sell anything so it's weird that. isn't it how especially no it's weird how especially nowadays that you can have hit records and not sell tickets where it used to be like you'd have hit records and because radio stations were well, radio stations and that's all people would listen to everyone would know who you are i feel like there was a lot less hit records and now there's way more niches of to have hit records mm. in mm. um but i think that is the hard thing as well and on a financial situation although you can start, still earn very good money from from streams and making music and writing and being on cuts and publishing deals and record deals and things like that the majority of most artists make their money from the live live aspect yeah, 100%. um and i think that's also what a lot of people don't realize is like building a fan base is the hardest bit but it also takes a t- takes time yeah and i've seen it with you guys right it's like i didn't when you f- when i first was aware of you guys i didn't know you were djs mm. didn't have a clue yeah. like I just thought you're singer songwriters and and you can write great records. Happy days mm. for you. I didn't know there was a a bigger goal of the DJ and cuz the story wasn't being yeah. told. Mm. But now it is and you're fucking sick DJs and and you're touring now and it's been really nice from afar to like even since like hanging out with you on on ship and like actually seeing like damn it's actually working. Like they've said what they wanted to do and it's actually working. Yeah. And however long that takes it doesn't matter because it will we know it will get yeah I, I actually remember that it's, it's so interesting you said that because it kind of didn't you know there wasn't loads of shows flipping in post there was shows but like we weren't known as DJs so they couldn't really book us because they didn't know we were DJs so you were kind of having to explain to people what the show looks like and then maybe there's like a singing element that was a bit confusing for people yeah and then we were in a session with Frankie Wa um uh, up north, uh, writing just stuff uh, uh, for his stuff or, and for our stuff, and um, yeah, he basically just—I uh, won't, you know, bore you with all the details, but he basically opened our eyes up to like how intentional you have to be with like yeah. all that side of stuff. He's like, "So, what do you guys want to do?" And we were like, "And you know what?" He's like, "I don't know if you've ever met him. He's very like stern. He's very like focused. Yeah, just and do he's that. Very present." Yeah, and he yeah. and he so he's like, so what do you want to do? And we we're like, well, we want to do this. And he's like, well, then you need to do this. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, yeah. So what's your touring like? Do you just do you just do shows in the UK? Oh no, we don't really get booked in the UK. It's mainly Europe. He's like, right. Well, if you want to get on a UK festival, you need to prove to the festival that you have a fan base, and that means going around and scooping up, you know, club shows in the UK, and then you'll get booked at Creamfields because you can sell yeah. tickets for Creamfields if you're on the lineup, and you're like. And then, yep. you know, it just took someone to sit down and actually explain it to us and be like, ah, and there's ways to be proactive. It's not like we'll just keep being in the studio and wait on a hit and we'll be in the studio and wait to like start to do numbers and we'll work on our graphics and our photos and all that crap. It's like, no, you can just go out and like, you can press bookers and you can call people and you can be like, hey man, can I support you? Like he literally loaded up, um, he was like, who's your booker? Uh, and our book at the time was X, let's say. And then he was like, um, yeah. uh, he was like, right, who's your guy? Found the guy. He was like, oh, he has all these clients. And then he got clicked on a client. And then he was like, okay, go away and find out where all these people are touring at the moment. And then we yeah. went and found out who was touring, and one of them was a big artist. And then we got like, was it like twelve dates, Josh, or something? Like, I think we it was. I think it ended up being even sixteen. Yeah, we pressed the booker and just said, can we go on support? And then. You know there was a negotiation and then but it just happened because he was like you're just sat here and you could be doing way more and it was like ah yeah <laughs> that there's practical stuff. it's so tr- it's so true it's so true and i think there's comes a point where it's actually really hard to i think it's as artists it's very easy to just go to like i'll blame my agent that i'm not being successful in certain markets blame this blame that 
and it you need a level of you need something to be able to go yeah it makes sense for you to be on that show yeah, right? yeah. like you're not necessarily like if you're just kind of a nobody coming in and you can't you're not going to get that situation you need a milestone yeah. in your career to have had that you guys had that it makes sense for you to be able to go out and push bookers to yeah, do that. True. but it also takes a level of like just being in the booker's yeah. mind being in the agents my agents in especially in uk and europe i don't want to talk shit but like they're not they don't work how they do in america american agents are just on another oh level gosh. of business <laughs> yeah. they're the fucking best yeah. it just, it's just it's just completely yeah, different yeah. um but but i think it, you're you're 100 right and look at frankie's career yeah like in in a comparison like covid he I, I didn't know him before covid like he had that come together record and that's when i know of him we literally released the same yeah. week and look where he's at now he's he's way bigger than i am in a level of selling tickets and streams and he's from what i see he's been doing it for th four years yeah he changed this he kind of like didn't change his sound but he really went hard at like it, yeah you know that sound became really popular like melodic techno and then he was like releasing like whole albums on his own label and i was like i mean yeah. i remember like it was kind of just locked down or just after and he was kind of like telling us people who'd already agreed to release on his label but his label didn't exist yet and i remember just being like yeah. what do you mean like how have you, how have yeah. you even done that and he was just like yeah man you just gotta like you gotta do it and i was like just yeah ask. It's, it's, and, and, and and i think you can rest on your morals sometimes and go oh well i'm an artist and like you say i've got all these people who take uh, money to do it for me um so therefore i don't have to do the work when the reality is you're gonna have to do it yourself to an extent and you should go out and just do you know what i mean like go do it yourself and then loop people in yeah. and you know it, it probably won't just happen for you like that's probably going to be a graft element it never will it never yeah. will I, I don't think anyone it i don't think it happens for anyone even yeah i, I just i don't see it ever ever doing that like whether it, I've seen it with artists where like they've been stuck in that rut for so many years and then they just decide to do something new. They move to Berlin, they move somewhere <laughs> and like just hustle. And it's like, that's the hustle. Yeah. You, you take a year, two years of hustle with you guys, like three to six years of just hustling and then eventually it clicks. And then there comes a point when you're in that stage where you're like, oh, I'm just coasting. And then you have to hustle yeah. again. Yeah, and like and even then, at and then the you, top level, like that's happening. Do you know it, it, a couple of 100%. this is like this is a massive name drop but I'm, it's actually a useful point i'm not just doing a name drop i got invited to go and stay with uh david getter in ibiza and mm. like he is at the top top of the game like in terms of selling tickets he doesn't need to be hustling and he had three studios on the go in his house like yeah. with live-in producers and was flying in top liners for like three days at a time for the entire summer. Yeah. And so if you think about like, so even he is hustling like that to get, you know, to get hit records. Yeah. It's, it's crazy that what we need to be doing. <laughs> well, I, yeah, and I think the, the yeah, you're 100% right. These people are successful for a reason. That like whether you like the music or not, that's completely irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? But these people are successful for a yeah. reason, and and I think that is a, a really pa apparent thing that people just don't realise a lot of the time is you just fucking have to work yeah. really it's hard. So worky. And you're not being nobody's being thing. given it. It's yeah. so worky, no, nobody. and it's also now like workier than ever because it's so competitive, and like the one thing that I've been trying to like say to people uh, r really recently is that even if you're not seeing a level of success that you want to see right now th there's something about the universe call it whatever you want d there's no like like hard work it just doesn't go unnoticed and it isn't in vain so even mm -hmm. if you just graph yeah. and graph and graph for 10 years and you don't have that success it will ma like manifest itself in some which way, whether you discover yeah. a business idea along the way or it's not in music, blah, 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 blah. But if you graph, there just always is 
I've seen too many people completely beast us for work rate and watch them become yeah. successful and go, yeah, fully. Like, not like James Hyatt for one. Just when James was uh, following up more than friends, he'd had a big moment. Uh, he'd released like two more records and then lockdown happens. And he just like, even when he, he came to a writing camp, I think we hosted uh, once at Universal. And I remember him telling me about his day and it was like a Wednesday and yeah. it was like, yeah, man, I've been to the gym. Uh, I'll do this session. I'll go home. Uh, I'll do da -da -da -da, some stuff for the weekend, like mix it. And then I'll, um, and then he was telling me about how like he organizes his evening. It was like, oh, I do all like stuff. I really don't want to do first. Like I'll, all my like programming for my DJ sets and all that sort of stuff. And then I'll do like creative stuff that I enjoy. And then he's like, yeah, I'll probably finish like three, four in the morning. And then yeah. I'll go to bed and then I'll wake up, I'll go to the gym, I'll do all again. And I remember sat there in the session being like, you knew all that today. Like, I'm going home after mm. the session. I'm going to go to sleep, <laughs> probably eat some food. But like, yeah. then the proof is in the pudding and he's doing what he's doing now. And I'm like, yeah, it, it's just graft. Like, it's so much work. And, I, do, I do think yeah. it's important to say, because like from the outside looking in, people might listen to this conversation and go like, oh yeah, good boys, but it's easy for you to say that because your first song went big. Uh, and whilst that's true, uh, the truth, the real, <laughs> the, the real, the real truth is that we had been writing songs for, you know, five years before that, that had never been heard yeah. by anybody. And I can remember our other mate, uh, Connor, Connor Blake, he's an incredible songwriter. Uh, he wrote Peace of Your Heart, Lose Control, Paradise, a, a whole load of other songs we've written together. And, um, me and him were sat in this little studio that somebody was letting us use. And we'd done like 40 songs together over the period of 18 months. Um, and the, a load of them were crap. And we were sat there and we're like, we've got these songs that are finished and are done. And we think they're really good. And then there's the radio. And I just don't know what's in the middle. Like, I just don't understand how you make that link. Mm. Um, and we just went through like everybody that we knew who had any kind of tenuous link to the music industry. And this is the real life story of how it happened. And Connor like knew somebody that like was somehow related to Capital Radio. I think he was like doing the DJing, but not, not the presenter. He was DJing whilst somebody else presented yeah. sort of behind the scenes. And then we sent the songs to him and we sent the songs that day to like 30 people. And then mm. uh, this guy who's an absolute legend is called Nathan. He like knew one of the guys from Medusa like from years ago and sent the demos to him. And that's, that's how it happened for us is like essentially is we did loads of graft and then one day we're just like, hang on a minute, how can we get these songs to a person in the music industry and just scattergunned and it's very blessed and very grateful to Nathan that that uh, sort of happened. Well, and I think that is the that is the crux of this whole conversation, really, isn't it? Is that put the work in? You have to be good as yeah, well. Yeah. Like you can you can put the work in, you can still be shit, right? <laughs> like at the end of the day. Right. But like <clears throat> maybe go do something else. But <clears throat> I think it's you make your own luck 100%. yeah and people sometimes play as a song and then they go what do you think about it and you're like yeah it's good you got anything else and they're like oh no like i really like this one and you're like mm. cool man uh like like uh, yeah more. like let's sit park it let's make more while you don't have an outlet for that yeah. one or maybe you do like let's get it out but like uh i think when you first start but like you know even i did this and i'm sure um you guys have done it to an extent like you make something, you're really happy with it, you're really proud of it, and then you stay there, and you're like, how do I, this is really good, what do I do with it? And you're like, no, you need to like, you, you know, keep making more of it, and you'll probably make yeah. something better, and the chances are it isn't that good. <laughs> yeah, so, when you listen back in like six months time, you're like, oh, that's so embarrassing. Like, I can't <laughs> believe I played that to somebody. Yeah. It's, it's products at the end of the day and I think what a lot of people don't think because we're artists it's like don't look at it as a product and in the business world it is purely a product right it's like 
how many cars did Henry Ford design to get to the the Ford Escort? Yeah. yeah. Right? Like how many how many failures did they have to get through to get to the point where it was the most successful car company in the yeah. world? And it is that it's how many how many bad songs do you have to write to get that one good so song? So many. And it's so easy to write an average song. Yeah. So easy, right? It's like easy. So like we're writing average songs every single fucking yeah. day. <laughs> like I, I did, I did three yesterday, yeah. where you're just like, yeah, they're they're good. They could pass. Yeah. They could get released. They're not gonna do fuck yeah. all if you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. But to get to that one record that that does do well, which you don't ever know if it is gonna be that record. Yeah. Like you've got to try. Yeah, I, I got, got famously had a conversation with uh, someone who works at a record label, and they asked about what um, they asked about a song, and I said they were like, "If we put it out, do you think it will be big?" And I said, "Well, I usually would say, which is because like there's a, there's an element of self like self promotion where you could be like, yeah, man, this is a smash, this Happy. is a smash hit, like it's going to be great.'" And I just felt in the moment to be really honest, and I was like, "I don't know, man. Like, I don't know." Yeah. Uh, and then he was like, "But what was it like before PC Heart?" And I said, "Same feeling, no idea." Yeah, but you've like you've heard PC Heart before it came out. You heard Loose Control before it came out. You heard even Ferrari before it came out. And you've heard like songs before they came out. Was there like, I'm like, yeah, I just think it's good, man. I I don't know what else to tell you. There yeah. is no algorithm. There is no thing. I, I sometimes like joke to Josh like there's a 13 year old boy that lives inside of me who I try and this sounds so weird but I try and harness <laughs> that energy <laughs> carefully it's 13 year old careful. Ethan to be clear it's not yeah, anybody not, else yeah. it's 13 year old you I don't have a 13 year old boy in my house so there's like this 13 year old on the inside who I'm trying to like does he have this gut jerk reaction to a record and go ah something happened there i like that that's usually about as close to like amazement when you work in the music industry as you can pop, pop, you, you, like yeah. if you can re if you can tap into what you're actually feeling the first time you hear a record because you can never hear it for the first time ever again so you just need to put yourself and go that thing that i felt did it do a tiny thing yet that's probably something that it will do to most people and that's about as good a gauge yeah. as you get like uh, the, we were in a session once with a, a, a writer called Arrow Benjamin and he uh, did the running record with Beyonce and loads of other stuff for her and he's an mm. insane person to speak to he's very cool and uh, we are not cool and he, I remember we were writing a song and like you said Will it was like bang average it was fine and he was just really honest and he was like ah there's no moment we should move on and I, I remember yeah. being like what do you mean and he was like well we haven't created a moment within the song so any yeah. hit record that you've ever heard has got a moment within it where you go, ah, cool. Uh, and and whether it's a cool like underlick or whether it's a cool hook or whether it's like with PC Heart, it was the like stop the record dead. Oh, what? Sorry, just you know, like th there's yeah. a moment of which catches your attention, and I think that's about all you can do to chase a record and go. I think that that's good, but the ultimately we've got no bloody idea what we're doing. <laughs> still don't I love that I love that and I think it's the most perfect way to end this we've just done an hour and a half really um, lads yeah Whoa. it's fucking gone quick um, thanks for coming on lads I really really appreciate it how can people follow you how can people get involved with the good boys movement and uh, yeah how, how do you get how, how do people do that tell the people tell the people what they Josh, want to know you're good at it you can follow us <laughs> You can follow us on Good Boys at Good Boys OFF on all socials. And if you check us out on YouTube, we've got a couple of mixes that we're uploading every couple of months in beautiful locations. And we'll see you somewhere around the world soon. Sick. Nice one, lads. Thanks, Thanks for so much for coming on. Appreciate Catch it. See you, see you mate. Bye bye. Bye. And that's a wrap. Big love to the lads for coming on. Really enjoyed that conversation. It was a very insightful conversation. Hope you enjoyed it. Please share it. Please give us a review. And uh, see you next time. Big love. Keep safe.